Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our online service. It's so great that you guys are able to tune in this morning and join us for worship and hearing from the word from Pastor Matt uh, as we continue our verse-by-verse study through the book of Philippians. Before we sing songs to our Lord, before we offer up these sacrifices of praise, would you guys join me in a word of prayer? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your great love and wisdom, the love that caused you to send your son Jesus to die on our behalf, to offer himself up as the propitiation of our sins. We thank you that there is life, that there is forgiveness in his name. We thank you, Lord, that you dwell in us now through the power of your Holy Spirit. And we thank you, Lord, that we can rejoice, that we can delight in you and in the victory that you have won. So would you open our eyes this morning, Lord, to behold anew just how wonderful and glorious you are. We ask and we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's sing. Be thou my vision.
thanks.
Good morning, church. Good to see you guys. Good to be with you. Thank you for tuning in digitally to the uh, Sunday morning message this morning. Hope you guys are surviving the heat and uh, enjoying some sunshine as it is pumping here in Salinas. So we're going to be continuing our verse-by-verse teaching uh, with our Philippians series this morning. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Philippians chapter 1. I wanted also just to remind you of a couple of announcements that you might want to take note of. One is uh, our youth group is meeting again in person, and we have our students from 6th grade to 12th grade meeting here at the church on Friday nights from 6 to 8 with all the social distancing uh, guidelines in place, and, uh, and they are having a blast. So if you have a high school or middle school student that you would like to get plugged in, we'd love to have you uh, bring them and, uh, and have them here at the, the youth group service that Austin uh, leads for the church. Again, that's Fridays at 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Also, if you're tuning in online and you would like to uh, come to our service, but you're maybe not exactly comfortable getting out of the car yet or for one reason or another, uh, cannot or, or won't uh, join us for the actual in-person service, I wanted to let you know that we are setting aside six or seven uh, parking spots that are directly along the chain, chain link fence that uh, you could pull up in your car, roll the windows down, and take in the service uh, through sort of a drive-in kind of style of, of church service, if that's what you would prefer um, that's it for announcements. I want to get right into the Word of God this morning and want to start by reading out of chapter 1 of the book of Philippians, verse 27. It says, Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I, am, whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation and that from God. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now hear is in me. Let's pray. Father, I ask and pray that as we open up your word this morning, that you would speak to our hearts, God. Father, that we would continue to put ourselves before you to say, Lord, whatever you would have to speak, I want to hear and I want to listen. I want to apply that. God, do a work in our hearts. Do a work in our lives. Lord, speak to us now. We trust you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. This portion of Scripture is some of my most favorite uh, that Paul writes in the New Testament. You know, I'm a big conduct type person. Conduct to me is very important. How do we live? What does our life say about the Lord or what it may, might not say about the Lord? And every time I consider kind of the way of life that I'm choosing to live, attitudes that I'm having or responses that I'm coming along or, or coming up with, I, I am constantly reminded of this portion of text. You know, Paul here was giving a strong encouragement to the Philippian church to say to them, your conduct, let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. I don't know about you, but that sounds and seems like an extremely high bar that Paul has set, right? That he is saying to this church as he's writing to them in prison, he wants to hear that their conduct is worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have to ask ourselves this morning, what does it mean for our lives to be worthy of the gospel? The question is, what does it look like to live in a manner worthy of the gospel? You know, that word conduct or conduct is, is, is translated to live as citizens. So when he commands others, or when Paul is commanding and, and encouraging others to live in a worthy way, he is saying to them that we should live in a way that shows what we believe is of supreme worth. I mean, think about that for a minute. You know, we talk about living our lives in a way that would be a witness to others, but it's actually the, the, the thing that is most important is that people would actually see the way that we live or hear the way that we talk or look at the way that we conduct ourselves and to say this person, this person who is a Christian is living as a citizen of Jesus Christ, right? That we are living in a way that, is, is, that, that sees and portrays Jesus as being big and powerful and glorious. You know, what does it look like to live a life that, is, that in, a, is in a manner is worthy of the gospel? It looks like dying with Christ to our selfish desires, our self-centered sin tendencies, and being raised in Christ to walk in this newness of life with the brothers and sisters that God has put around us. What does it look like to live in a manner worthy of the gospel? It could be said this way. It means living a grace-filled life that grants patience and mercy and gentleness for the spiritual journeys of others and a respect for the differences that we all bring to the Lord's table. You know, there is, a, there is a, a, a conduct that we could have that says, although other people who are Christians are not like me, I'm going to respect them. One of my favorite sayings, and I don't know who said this, but I love it, it's that the, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. There's not going to be one better or one worse or one preferred and one non-preferred. We're not going to get into these are elite and these are non-elite. No, it is all level. And if it is level at the foot of the cross, it is to be level in the church. Although there might be differences, I will respect that person. I'll be gentle with them or patient with them or merciful with them or grace-filled with them. To live a life in a manner worthy of the gospel is to forgo our desires and to choose and make a conscious decision to choose the way that Jesus would have us to live. You know, that conduct is so important. And as Paul sort of is laying this out, he says in the latter part of verse 28, whether I come and see you or I'm absent, he wants to hear 
of their affairs that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. I think this boils down what Paul's major concern was as he really begins this letter to the Philippians. His main concern, his primary concern was a unified stand for the gospel. Paul wanted the Philippians to to know that, that this Philippian church was to stay together as one body without becoming, you know, segregated and fragmented and 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 broken apart, but that it would be a a, a of most importance and greatest impact for this church to stay together. Right? It's almost as if the picture is, is, is a term that athletes would use that would, that would refer to the team, right? It takes a team, oftentimes, to experience victory. It takes the church standing with one another, preferring one another, valuing the unity to experience and ex- expect effectiveness in this world. Paul when he is saying to the, the Philippian church, when he's saying that they are to stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel, he is saying that there is no respite. There is no respite for the Christian life. There is no respite from Christian obligation. We are to be tenacious. We are to have a spirit of tenacity. The words that Paul uses do not imply any sort of like, if you feel like it, when it's convenient, or sometimes do this and other times do that. No, Paul is saying, stand fast, be tenacious in one spirit, with one mind, striving together. With all of that, striving together. And then in verse 28, he says, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries. Don't be terrified by your adversaries. Don't be, don't be flinching at the, your adversaries and their threats towards you. But when you stand together as a church, unified, you will be able to endure great persecution. Whoever the opponents were at this point to the Philippians, they were not to be intimidated by them. Paul goes on in verse 28 and he says, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation and that from God. So when Christians are not terrified, are not shrinking back from their their adversaries, when we we don't uh, do that, that is a proof of perdition for those who are bringing the, 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 the threats and stuff to the church. It's, a, it's, a, it's proof of their destruction, right? Christians are not to be terrified by adversaries as it is evidence of our own salvation. In the Lord, we, as Christians, can surprise ourselves with our boldness. You know, there's times where you think, man, how did that even happen? And you trace it back to the Lord. I was having a conversation this last week with a very good friend of mine, and he was here at church uh, the past Sunday, and he had heard the message that God had spoken, and, and some things were stirred within him, and he was, he was in his neighborhood, which happens to be the neighborhood that I live in as well, and he was walking his dog, and a car was just totally speeding through the neighborhood, and my friend, he decided to sort of take it upon himself to sort of protect the neighborhood. So he put his hands up and yelled at the guy, slow down. The guy continued to kind of plow through the neighborhood even faster. So my friend got a little bit more emboldened and he went out to the middle of the street so that the guy could see him in his rear view mirror. And he held out his arms and he just said, come on, slow down. Well, the guy hit his brakes and decided to make a U-turn to come back to my friend who was now, you know, telling him and being very bold to say, slow down. A lot of emotions running through his mind at this point. He's telling me this whole story. And he just said, Matt, when, I, when this guy came up to me, I was, 
I was moved. I felt the Spirit sort of, I sensed that the Spirit was saying, you need to, you need to, to seize this as an opportunity for me. The guy pulled up. The guy apologized. The guy said, hey, it's not you. It's me. I've had a really tough day. I'm having a hard time. And my friend, who was emboldened by the power of the Holy Spirit, said, can I just pray for you? I believe God wants to, to minister to you. And my friend began to pray for this guy who was speeding through the neighborhood. The guy broke down emotionally. He said, you don't know how much this, will, this means to me and all of that. And, and it, was a, it was a scenario of great boldness. And God was, was used the opportunity. Right? There are times where you, you get this bold sort of spirit. Um, and, and, and it's just like, where did that come from? That comes from the Lord. Man, this fly. I don't know if you guys can see it, but this fly is about to die. It is buzzing all over me. I'm trying to stay focused. So we can be emboldened by and because of in the face of our adversaries. Now, let's go to verse 1 of chapter 2. He says, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy. Now, those are obviously all rhetorical questions. There are all of those things in Christ. But in verse 2, he says, Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for your own interest, but also for the interest of others. Paul sort of transitions in his thoughts here. And he transitions from the need to withstand pressure from the outside to the attitudes that we, the church, are to be categorized by as Christians some of the attitudes that we're to have, some of the approaches that we are to have. Now, this we read in four verses in our Bibles, but in the original text, in the original Greek text, this would have been uh, one long sentence. And this sentence could pretty much be sort of uh, boiled down to Paul saying, make my joy complete. Make my joy complete. What would complete Paul's joy? What would be the thing that Paul would see in his heart and, and or excuse me, experience in his heart with what he saw or heard in his eyes that would be something where he would say to this fly, I'm sorry, to say, my joy is now complete. In verse Verse 2, he says, fulfill my joy by being like-minded. So Paul would see his joy complete by hearing of their unity. Hearing of their unity. It's a personal appeal to encourage them forward to the glory of God. That is what would be that would what is what would complete Paul's joy. You know, and I think it's important, though, for us to understand when it comes to unity. Unity is not uniformity. Unity is not uniformity. It's not unity is not found in an identical lifestyle or personality. This isn't even the heart of God, I don't think, right? Look at the diversity in our world today. Look at the languages and the differences of people. God is the creator of all of those things. It's not God's heart that all of us would be identical in the way that we live and, and what, we, what we say and what we laugh at. That is, that is uniformity. That is not unity. Paul sought for the church to value others but having this like-mindedness. He goes on and says there's three characteristics that express unity in the church. And they're found in verse 2. Having the same love, 
being of one accord and of one mind. These three characteristics express the unity of the church. They are the goals for which to strive, and they provide the measurement of success. Right? So together, these speak of the unity found of those who are going in the same direction. Right? When we think about unity, we are going in the same direction. We are like-minded. We have the same love. We're of one accord. We're of one mind. And there's nothing fake about this. It cannot be. This is not a fake thing to approach. Unity amongst the church, a value in others, and all of these things cannot be superficial. Unity is to come from the core of each and every one of us. But please understand me, we're not all supposed to speak the same or act alike. Why? Because uniformity is different than unity. Unity is a togetherness. Uniformity is straight up, everybody does this, this, and this. We're all the same. That's not what I'm saying. That was Paul's, that was Paul's heart. He says, and this unity is expressed in three ways. Having the same love, being of one accord, and one mind. So unity was extremely important to Paul. Paul knew that the way that the Philippian church would continue to grow and have greater impact and greater success is if they were unified together. And look at how unity is measured. In verse 3, unity is measured by humility. Let's look at it. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Unity is measured by humility. Selfish ambition and conceit are inevitably enemies of fellowship and hindrances of unity. They're enemies of fellowship and they're hindrances of unity. Unity is measured by humility. Who set the greatest example of humility for all of humanity to look at? It was Jesus. Jesus and his humility set the standard for evaluating the worth of others and actions towards them, right? The worth of others. Jesus came to die for the world. The people who were beating him whipping him, spitting on him. He didn't return their actions with just actions. He acted towards them in a humble way, in a way that placed value on them. So when we look at humility, we have to look at ourselves and others as being in the image of God. We are in the image of God. Believers should be humble towards one another, mindful of their spiritual brothers and sisters. And they're ultimately subjected to God, not to us. Right? So when we, when we exercise humility, the thing that runs through our minds is consider others better than myself. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to consider you better than myself. This doesn't mean, though, that we have sort of this false or unrealistic view of our gifts as compared with those of others. It just simply puts the value that we would want put on us onto them. When we look at humility, we look at the example that Christ gave us. Unity is measured by humility. Not only is it measured by humility, but look at verse 4. Unity is measured by consideration. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Unity is measured by consideration. The Philippians were to look out for others' interests as if they were looking out for their own. 
They were to be considerate. They were to pursue unity under the approach and banner of humility as well as consideration. A true obstacle to unity is not the presence of differences of opinion, but really just sort of self-centeredness, right? It's just a self-centeredness. It's just sort of this idea, this approach that just says it is all about me. You know, I've sat with a lot of couples. Kristen and I have sat with a few couples together. And as we sit with these couples that are coming to us with some if issues or differences or just straight up, you know, di- like sin and, and all of this stuff, we sit with them and we just tell them, you know, share your story with us, get us up to speed, kind of what's happening. And they begin to share. And as each of these couples have shared, yeah, there's actions that have been taking place that lead to some of the issues that are at hand. But those actions can often be traced back to a self-serving, self-centered approach to the decision. I mean, 99 times out of 100, it's, you can trace it back to this sort of self-centeredness mentality. This mentality that just says, it's all about me. You know, Kristen and I have, are, have on Friday, celebrated our 16th wedding anniversary. And, you know, we've, we have so much to learn. We have so much to still uh, gain and, and explore and all that, but 16 years. And I was thinking about it, looking back on our, our time together, looking back on what it was, you know, what our marriage was like and our relationship was like in the early years. And we were both pretty young, 21 and 22 when we got married. When we got married, I turned 22 a week after that. But I remember, you know, looking back on so many of our, our, our challenges and difficulties and struggles then as just like a self-centeredness, just a self-seeking sort of approach rather than just simply serving, simply preferring, simply just being humble doing the things that I don't like doing. You know, inserting myself at times where I thought, but I'm tired, or I'm this, or I'm that. And so many of, of the wedges that are in marriages and in, in relationships and within the church center around a serious self-centeredness. What's so interesting, though, is that we will oftentimes put it under the banner of, well, there's just differences there's just differences, right? I just don't get along with that person because of the way that they talk about this or that or because they're this supporter or they're that supporter. Or they, they, they don't want to wear a mask or they won't wear a mask or whatever it might be, right? We, we, center, we, 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 we frame it under this idea that it's the, it's the opinion or the approach that that person is taking, but it's oftentimes, if we're being honest, can be traced back to us. We are to imitate Christ. We are to keep, keep Christ, Jesus, as the focus. We are to remember that He died for us in spite of the fact that we were not spiritually attractive. So when we look at some of the troubles, when we look at some of the difficulties, we need to first look at our lives to say, who am I concerned with first? If you give your life to your spouse or to relationships or to ministry or to the church or whatever it might be, and you start serving, you start preferring, you're not walking around proud, but you're humble, you will rise above that selfish strife of man. You'll begin to see things in your life come to pass that you have never seen before. Paul strongly encouraged the church there in Philippi to remain unified so that they could stand and have that tenacity to 
be of one mind, one spirit, the same love, seeing that humility is a measurement of unity and in consideration being the same. And that's my prayer for us. It's my prayer for myself. It's my prayer for what God does in our midst. That we would be selfless, considerate, spirit-filled, Bible-loving, Jesus absolutely at the center of everything we do. We want to rise above. We want to rise above. Let's pray. Father, we, as we come to you now, Lord, our flesh is willing. Our flesh is at the forefront. And God, we have to reckon that old man dead. We have to crucify that old man. And this morning, God, that's what we pray. Crucify the old man. I want to walk in the Spirit. In humility and considering, but having a tenacity to stand fast. and To not be afraid. Fill us with your Holy Spirit to do that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen, church. God bless you guys. Have a great Sunday. We will see you next week. Amen.